Hey, it's Norm from Tested.com. I'm here at CES 2015, joined by Nate Mitchell, VP of Product at Oculus VR. It's time for our annual check-in <laughs> with Oculus. This is the third time we've had this conversation. It is. And you guys have gone so far since. Uh, at CES, for the first time for the public, you guys are showing the Crescent Bay, which is uh, the latest public prototype for uh, for Oculus. Yep. Uh, this is like a five-month-old technology. I it just is. want to point that out already. We and were talking about that yesterday. It's like six, seven months old. Well, for people who haven't experienced yet, let's reiterate some of the things you guys put in the Crescent Bay and how sure. it differs from DK2, Development 2, which you guys have shipped about 100,000 of. Yeah, uh, we've shipped about 75,000. 75,000. And then 75,000 of DK1. So overall, it's somewhere around you know, 130, 140. It's a lot of people already kind of sold, bought into Oculus and virtual yeah, reality. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, just, it's awesome to see that many developers interested. So uh, Crescent Bay, it's a, it's a newer, uh, it's lighter. Yep. Um, and I got to talk about the screen. Mm -hmm. I know you can only say so much. Yes. Uh, we know it's 90 hertz. It's running yes. at, at least um, 90 frames per second on the PC side. Yep. And that's one of the benchmarks you guys wanted to meet for the presence. Yep. And this is the first public device you've shown that you guys are convinced sells the idea of, of presence. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is one of the really major differences with Crescent Bay is not only the presence side of things, but the comfort side. So as a integrated holistic system, it really does deliver um, a level of presence that you can't achieve just with DK2. And that is uh, a bit in a big part because of low persistence. The 360 degree tracking makes a big difference. Ergonomics, comfort, the optics, um, mm -hmm. we've changed significantly. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about all Sorry, those I'm things. <laughs> no, no, I know, it's, it's a great overview. Uh, display, at least 90 hertz. Yes. DK2 is 75 hertz. Yes. You're running games at above 90 frames per second. I mean, yep. a lot of gamers on their desktop monitors are running at 144 hertz monitors. Mm -hmm. So technology's out there. I know you have a partnership with Samsung, and Palmer did confirm it's an AMOLED screen. Yes. You want to get people the, the point across that resolution is not the end all be all. Yes. Right? So I'm not going to ask about what the exact resolution is, but I will ask about what you're rendering games at. Are sure. you rendering this at native resolution, or does it matter? I actually don't know what we're rendering at. Um, we're rendering slightly higher than the native resolution, but it's like a super sampling technique. Okay. So we're hiring at a, a higher screen percentage and then kind of scaling back down. Um, but it, we should be rendering at the native resolution on the display, yes. Okay. Will's over there <laughs> using Gear VR, actually, which is your other Oculus product, partnered with Samsung, of course. Absolutely. So with Gear VR, you're using a 1440p display. Yes. And are, are things like super sampling and the combination of new optics, are those ways to get around trying to cram as many pixels as you need on the screen? I mean, somewhat. I mean, you always want to be rendering at the highest resolution possible. And um, super sampling is definitely an effective way to just get more pixels onto the screen without uh, without fundamentally changing like uh, the pixel density mm -hmm. of, the, of the display. And so what you have is, um, if you're rendering, for example, if we were rendering just at the native resolution, there would be significantly more aliasing, for example, right. without that sort of technique. Um, on Gear VR, it's a little bit different because 1440p is already an extremely high yeah. uh, resolution. And when you add in the, uh, the 60 hertz low persistence, it is already, there's not much room for additional bandwidth. To increase. On the mobile side. Exactly. Right. Um, I mean, we're already doing a lot on that mobile GPU, putting it through its paces. Um, but on PC, we can do a lot more just because we have the horsepower under the hood. So let me get this straight. On the mobile side, it's OK to maybe you know, render a low resolution. The optics solve for a lot of that. And on the PC side, maybe optics or even solve for that more. So the, the, yes. something I want to get across is that it was very difficult to tell that this was even an AMOLED screen or an LCD screen because of the optics. Is yes. there some type of diffusing or anything you're doing with the optics to, to compensate for that, to try to help that pixel fill or yeah, get I, rid of the, the, the absolutely. great effect? One of the things that I think we talked about a little bit at uh, <laughs> Connect is that um, the display and the optics together are really a pair. And so when we're ever we're looking at display technology and optics, what we want to do is have them complement each other such that we are um, optimizing for the things that we think are important. Okay. With DK2, for example, there was a much sharper, much clearer image, but that actually resulted in a significantly more um, screen door effect, basically, mm -hmm. and visibility of sort of the pentile display. Right. And so what you see in Crescent Bay is we're doing a lot more um, to combine the optics and the display to smooth out some of those uh, pixels, or the space between the Optically pixels. Optically smoothing out some exactly. of those pixels. Exactly, okay. so that it doesn't, it looks effectively uh, like a high resolution display. 
Okay. Uh, does that affect readability for text, for example, and how people display text? It I know it's in the demos. That's a good question. <laughs> you don't see a lot of text. I mean, there is the loading screen, you know, yep. maybe in a billboard somewhere, but yep. you designed it to not allow you to read. So you're absolutely right. So in terms of the clarity, the text legibility is one of the challenges. I, I, it's not a major challenge because as long as, you know, just like any uh, sort of uh, rift, if you have uh, large text, it's very easy to read. So what we're talking about is when the text gets very, very small, it does tend to get blurry or a little crunchy. Um, so that's something we're going to continue to improve on. And overall, you know, we talked sort of high level about resolution. We do want to see major resolution improvements over the next, you know, two, three, four iterations of the product. You know, Abrash talks a lot about the we do want to head toward 4K and 8K right. and that sort of thing. His benchmark. Exactly. Yeah, maybe not a viable thing from a commercial standpoint today. Exactly. But looking so forward. We do want to see higher resolution displays get into the Rift over the long term. This is uh, still where we are today. Again, five month old technology at this point already. Yes. Um, something you've also, optics, one final thing. Yeah. Field of view, some people thought that the field of view in DK2 was a little too narrow. Yep. Uh, with radically changed optics here, um, is that, can you say, what is your acceptable field of view? So we want the field of view to be roughly over 110 degrees diagonal. Um, I think the Crescent Bay field of view is actually on par with DK2. I don't think it's significantly bigger or smaller. Um, yeah. So okay. we, you know, we want it to be. Uh, we're always going for a slightly higher field of view, mm -hmm. but there is a sweet spot, right? Because yeah. in terms of how much you want to be rendering on the display, in terms of how much the rent you want to be rendering in terms of field of view, the less field of view you have, the faster you, you know, you can render frames. Right. Um, so people, you know, sometimes ask, like, oh, are you going to go 180 degrees? That's not really an effective way to spend, you know, your horsepower on the mm -hmm. GPU side. So there is a sweet spot where you still get that feeling of presence because you are totally surrounded. Um, but it's not a ridiculous field of view that's destroying your, your uh, GPU. So let's move from the front of this headset to the back, yep. more toward the, the ears. Sure. And something you're showing off today is positional audio. Uh, talk about how difficult it is to put positional audio in, in a game and how that amplifies presence. Yeah, so it's actually not too difficult. Um, one of the things we talked about at Oculus Connect was that we had licensed the Visisonics technology mm -hmm. and we were starting work on an Oculus Audio SDK. And the idea there was really that developers don't have the tools right now to build great spatialized audio experiences. And when we talk about spatialized audio, what we mean is being able to have sounds actually be above, below, out in front, behind you. So when you have a stereo audio experience, it's mostly sort of on a flat plane, 360 degrees around you. So with the Oculus Audio SDK, developers and designers can take a sound, put it in a space, be like, I want this sound to be spatialized, and it'll actually sound like it's coming from that point, regardless of how the user moves their head. And so it recognizes can, where the user is positionally exactly. through the environment. And that's been one of the missing uh, things when it comes to HRTF technology, which is, one of the, which is the main technique we're using in the Oculus Audio SDK, is that the, the missing component was really great, precise, low latency head tracking. Now that you have that, you can do a lot, and um, it really is an effective way to uh, spatialize the sounds. Crescent Bay has built-in audio, and it does. it's something you guys want to build in. I know you're going to let people use their own headphones, yep. but uh, who's making the audio? Who's making the headphones I don't think we've said who's making the drivers for those. Okay, but Sorry. You're, you're, you're happy with the quality. We're happy with the quality. I mean, you know, obviously Crescent Bay across the board is a prototype, so it's still early days, and we're still obviously testing it too. One of the beauties of building these feature prototypes is that we can test, like, let's build a bunch of sets with this audio driver and see what we think, and see what people, you know, what their response to the experience is. Um, overall, it's a great audio driver that we're pretty happy with, but we can always do better, so we'll see. Let's From see the front is. of the head, let's go to the back of the head, yep. so we gotta talk about ergonomics. Yep. Uh, what lessons have you learned about designing HMDs. You still have the head strap. Yep. Some people making HMDs using a clamp mechanism or maybe stronger support for the nose bridge. Yep. What are your thoughts about ergonomics for HMDs going forward? <sighs> There's a lot we could talk about in ergonomics for HMDs. There's a lot of stuff that's not perfect about Crescent Bay. There's a lot of stuff that is right. Um, you know, we've gone for a more rigid strap for a number of different reasons. One is just weight distribution. Another is comfort. Another is actually tracking because it gives us a better sense of um, a sort of a better rigidity between this and this. So overall, we're pretty happy with uh, the weight distribution of this headset. I think it is the most comfortable headset. You have some losses in terms of like the portability of just wrapping it up and like mm -hmm. tossing it in your bag or something like that when it is more rigid. But um, it really does sit better on the head and it allows for the integrated audio component. How heavy is this? 
I actually don't know how heavy it is, but it's significantly lighter than DK2. It is, absolutely. I can confirm <laughs> that. And you don't, I don't expect you to ship our product to be much heavier than No, this is a great target weight. I think we would okay. like it to be always a little bit lighter. You know, absolutely. It's something we're always shooting for. We'll see where we end up. The other big thing that's challenging uh, on the Ergo is absolutely the uh, facial interface. Right. That's something we continue to go back and forth on. You know, there's so many different face shapes, face sizes, especially internationally. And so getting that right and giving people a solution that works with glasses, with different cheekbones, right. it, it's one of the things that we're going to continue to iterate on. It's and, not going to uh, be ski goggles like the very first prototype. Right. People it's, are knitting their own covers yep. for, for your DK2. And we want to help people get, uh, we want everyone to be able to use the Rift, obviously, so we're working on solutions there. It's a challenge. It's a, it's a major challenge. Now, in terms of comfortability and ergonomics, one of the things is that Preston Bay is a standing up demo. It is. Um, I didn't For sign now. a waiver this time, <laughs> and last time I talked to Palmer, he was very adamant that the Oculus Rift is sitting down. Is that a liability concern? Is that a, is that a health yeah. concern? Or? It's more of a, it's two parts. I mean, the part A is that we want to nail a seated experience first. And that's be just because this is so complex, so new, people are gonna put this thing on and go into this world and feel like, oh my God, I've been teleported if we do the, our job right. Um, and we want them to be seated for that. And so we want developers targeting seated experiences. It simplifies the setup. Like one of the things um, that we saw with Connect and we is that it is challenging to find enough volume in a house or an apartment to like have a nice space where you can walk around and be you know, playing Wii Sports or something like that. That's not gonna stop the fans out there That's not from stop creating stand-up experience. But it's another reason why you know targeting a stand-up experience really does reduce the number of people that are going to dive in and jump into VR. Okay. So for all of those reasons, we really want it to be seated first. And that's really like, you know, Oculus Rift is a seated experience. And it's tethered. I mean, you, you want it's, a wire connection because it's the lowest latency possible. Are you experimenting with wireless video, wireless HDMI? Wireless HDMI? video is not quite there. You don't it's think not it? something we're experimenting with too much for CV1. Um, it's just the latency, the cost. It's not really practical for mm -hmm. today's headset. The, right. the other thing I wanted to get to on, um, on standing up is what you alluded to, which is just liability. Overall, between the tethered experience and yeah. also, again, putting this thing on and basically being blindfolded in your apartment or home, you know, it is a risk. And we don't want people crashing into walls and running into TVs and all kinds of crazy right. stuff. Um, so from that perspective, we really do want people to sit down and experience the Rift that way. And I do think in terms of the presence that you know, you'll be able to achieve, it'll be, it'll be worth it. All right, from the head to the body, uh, control <laughs> input interfaces. Uh, very, so, I like that transition. Yes, uh, Brendan, <laughs> your CEO, you know, he alluded to the fact that you guys are experimenting with control interfaces, input interfaces. Always. And they're all, an output also, haptic feedback. Yeah. So you know, you, there's no eye tracking right now. There are a mm -hmm. lot of different input challenges. What's a, what do you think you feel like is the biggest, or the next challenge you would want to tackle? After input? In, in, in the input realm. In the input realm. So we actually have a lot of different parallel paths when it comes to input, where there's a lot of different things we've been exploring for a long time. We just acquired Nimble VR mm -hmm. and 13th Lab as well, adding a, a wealth of computer vision and tracking resources to the team. Um, input's a hard challenge. We gotta, yes. I gotta have to be careful about what I say about input, but... Um, I mean, gamepad is a very safe way. Gamepad is a great start for today. And although some of us would disagree, like Brendan would be like, ugh, gamepad, bad. I think gamepad allows for a lot of good experiences. Um, Keyboard full body is the goal, right? Full, uh, the full Brendan body. Said full, eventually, VR is going to reach a point where we're going to have the full body tracking. Absolutely. So when we look out like five, ten years, you know, the vision for VR is the same one we all share. You know, mm -hmm. Ready Player One, haptic yep. technology, full body tracking, where you and I, like we talked about, can have this interview from across, you know, the world uh, with full, you know, mm -hmm. eye tracking, mouth tracking, hand tracking, everything. We still got a long way to go for that. In the meantime, we want to deliver an input solution that is really high quality for VR that enables all sorts of cool experiences, especially in games. And we're looking at as a goal for C V one, let me rephrase this then. I, I don't know of many gaming platforms or entertainment platforms that have shipped that have not shipped without its input experience You're absolutely right. and then been successful. You're absolutely right. So okay. So I, I'm I'm right there. So th that's as much as you'll say. From a product and user experience perspective in particular, it's something I care deeply about and we really do need to nail it for the consumer version to be a great consumer product. Because you can't have a product that you take you you know you buy in a store, you take home, you mm -hmm. unbox and you're like, okay, well now how do I like use it. There's no input. Do I go buy a game pad? Do I use the keyboard and mouse? We know that's a bad experience. Right. So we are committed to nailing VR input. It may take us longer. It may take us a while. It may come sooner. 
you know, there were some allusions yesterday to some news. So, so, so what about developers then? Because you don't want to segment the development market. You already have basically two products, a mobile product yep. and a desktop product. Yep. You know, you want to make sure developers are going to make games that are going to maximize the, the consumer release. Yes. So you're, are you thinking of them as well? Always we're thinking of developers. And we're working with a number of developers um, on different input experimentation. It's, it's a tricky area. We do want to get it right. And input is something that may take us even a few dev kits to actually nail. So something to, uh, a few something dev to look kits. forward to. Although there probably will not be another dev kit before. Consumer there probably won't be another dev kit for the headset. Got but it. with input, we haven't shown anything quite yet. So when it does come out, it may be that it's more of a prototype, a feature prototype that evolves into a dev kit or something like that. I like that your choice of words. Before it comes fully to, to market. So we'll see. And one of the things we do, all, you know, it's our style to get hardware out there as fast as we can once we have something that we're really excited about, that we're proud of, and then get feedback from the community and developers. So we want to do that same sort of thing with input as it comes online. We did a lot of talking about the hardware and, of course, presence and the whole experience is a two-part thing. It's hardware and software. You're yep. owning both. Gear VR is your first kind of public demo of your, your paradigms for user experience and yes. interaction. Yes. What have you learned from Gear VR and how is that going to transition to a... Got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so when we uh, set out to build some of the interaction paradigms for cinema, Oculus Home, um, the universal menu, you know, we were kind of going in... Not totally blind, because it's stuff that we've been experimenting with for a long time, but we weren't sure what would work. And actually, you know, even Gear VR, the input mechanism in terms of the touchpad and, and the controller, that actually changed through the course of the product development. So, um, you know, everything that you see on Gear VR is still early days, whether it's the UI UX uh, for Oculus Home or Cinema, and we're going to be iterating on those and improving a lot. One of the things we're doing right now is from all the Innovator Edition you know, enthusiasts that have the headset, getting feedback directly from them, both through data and through just, you know, people are writing to us, developers are reaching out, hey, we love this, hey, we don't like this. And I do think we have a long way to go. What we've put out there is sort of a baseline foundation, and the goal is to really iterate quickly on top of that. So you're going to see changes flow into that pretty frequently, and we're excited about the experimentation we're doing there. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's one of the biggest challenges, interface. Definitely, and, and definitely. UI. And VR UI has never really been done, especially when we don't have a VR you know, input, right? We were just talking about, right? right? So it may be that the VR UI you see in Oculus Home today is completely obliterated when it comes to a totally different input device, whether that's gesture recognition or optical tracking or controllers or whatever it is. So there's a lot of changes we're going to see of rollout especially over the course of this year and next. And uh, yeah, we're, gonna, we're just excited to share it with everyone. Now, outside of gaming, there's a lot of other practical uses for your cool, innovative uses. Samsung has a camera. Yep. You know, Parrot has put used your Oculus, the DK1 at least, for their multi-rotor drones, for FPV. Are you looking at that? Do you care about that for consumer release, or are you focused more on games? We're focused on VR. I think what we want to deliver is a great product that really gives people uh, the ability to do whatever they want in VR. I think it's hard for us to invest a lot of resources into something like drones, for example, mm -hmm. because that's not going to, I don't think that's going to be massively impactful in terms of what when people buy the device. Uh, they're not going to see that as like a big, interesting area. That's my take. Um, so what we really want to focus on is enabling the hardware and software experiences that really take people someplace entirely new where they feel like they've been teleported. Um, now, I will say it's not just games. We are looking at things like film. We're going to be at Sundance in mm -hmm. a couple weeks doing some really neat stuff there. There's a ton of uh, art installations there that are using the Rift. So um, education, there's a lot of cool stuff uh, that's coming around the corner. So, But do you presume that most of your buyers early are going to be gamers? I PC absolutely gamers. think most of the buyers early are going okay. to be gamers. And we are gamers. You know, when we started the company, yeah. it was all about changing yeah. games. And we are still fully fundamentally committed to that. That's actually one of the things that makes VR input so hard, is how do you create an input system that allows for really compelling gaming experiences as well. So There's a lot of speculation about, you know, products life cycles. Let's say 12 months from now, you guys have shipped the CV1, my, my assumption, right? You're already, then you'll have two products, you know, so a mobile product and a desktop product. Are you afraid of segmenting? Like, when you go forward, are you focusing more on feature developments? Is it, you know, CV2, which we're you know, just speculate, is that something that you're going to split your existing audience fan base? I think it's too early to say. And, and it would be, it's really too early to even comment on something like that because we don't know necessarily what CV2 looks like right now. 
of course, we're always doing long-term research. And one of the things, you know, putting together the Oculus research team up in Redmond, that is one of the things they're looking at is the longer-term roadmap. We'll see what features come into CV2. It could be that it's a, a quick iteration on CV1 that, you know, addresses some of the things that we think are really going to, uh, like, fundamentally change the experience, but um, are more iterative and less, like, you know, groundbreaking new mm -hmm. technology. But... CV2 could also be totally different right. and an entirely new experience and input could change. So the we'll first see. launch is the most important and you want Absolutely. to make the biggest impact there. Absolutely. Okay. And that's really where all of our focus is right now, getting CV1 out the door. And we really appreciate the patience of everyone in the community who's, you know, rolling with us on this uh, on this journey. We have learned a lot and we're getting very close and we're yeah, excited to get something out. Thank sometime you so soon. much, Nate. I Absolutely. love having these conversations. Hope you guys like watching them as well. Hopefully next year when we have our fourth CES conversation, we'll be holding CV1 in our hands and talking about that experience. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, Norm. So I'm Norm from Tested. That's our check-in with Oculus VR at CES. We'll have more from CES on Tested.com. More VR stuff. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you next time. Bye. Okay, that was my first taste of Crescent Bay, Norm. What did you think? I want more right now. Yeah, that's I, what I, everyone says. I literally, um, the experience was much better than I expected. I mean, your descriptions were vivid, but being able to stand with the headset on, the headset is super comfortable. The, the weight, in, or the, the pad in the back that kind of cups the back of your skull with the lights, uh, with the back LEDs, so you can do a full 360, um, made a huge difference in comfort. It seems like it's a little bit lighter as well. Yeah. I, 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 I want more of that right now. So it's great to know that that's, like we said, it's something they debuted in September. It's five months old, and they're yeah. doing new prototypes almost every month, yeah, when, is what they told us. When we were talking before, he said literally every month or two for new prototypes. So what did you think about the image quality? Because the thing that's the most controversial thing about Crescent Bay is mm -hmm. you can't tell the resolution. They, they don't, they, the optics kind of, I a little presume, fuzzy. diffuse. Yeah. Um, the grid lines, the screen door effect, and what people have said is that it almost has this, like a linen effect. Like you can almost see, like depending on how you orient your head, um, like almost like scan lines. So the benefit of being extremely nearsighted is that I can still see the pixels in there. It's still clearly I, almost positive a pentile display. It's really hard to tell, especially compared to DK2. Um, I didn't find it offensive. I did, they didn't show any demos that had text though. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think there was Nate one loading that. screen. Yep. I, I can't imagine that a game like Elite or something like that, they're going to have to redesign the UI to pull out most of the text. Or at least, I, I think what will probably happen is people will design VR-specific fonts that are designed to take advantage, or to designed to bypass the problems with that type of display. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I thought overall, the thing I noticed is that there was some weird shimmering on edges and stuff like that that seemed like it needed a little bit more anti-aliasing. Which is interesting because when I asked them about resolution, my, my original hypothesis is we looked at the monitor mm -hmm. that the, the game was running on. They're running on GTX 980s because they had a run at 90. Dual? No, single Just GTX one, okay. 980s uh, at, 90, at least 90 frames per second. And I thought on this 27 inch display, it looked like they were rendering the game at 1920 by 1080 and sampling up. But what Nate told me was that they're actually super sampling down on the PC side. That makes sense. Uh, and that's some way that they get rid of some of the aliasing problems. And, and that would, that would, that's why you're not seeing aliasing on the center of things, but anything that has edges or is a sprite or something like that, I noticed some, some anti-aliasing on, or some aliasing on. Um, the other thing I noticed was that the low poly demos, the, there's a, uh, like a cardboard city, mm -hmm. um, there's a kind of low poly farm, yep. I guess. Like a fox and a fire. Mm -hmm. yep. Fox and a fire and an oxen maybe, mm -hmm. and then there's some fish. Uh, like those, those low poly things looked much, much better than I expected, which I guess we should have known because Super Hot was pretty low poly yep. and looked really good. Um, but combined with what looked like a really talented low poly artist building those demos, like that stuff was, was very impressive. Yeah, my feeling is that the, the best games for VR aren't necessarily, the AAA games aren't necessarily gonna be the ones that look like your Unreal Engine 4 Call of Duty games or your Although crazy the high Unreal poly. Engine 4 Call of Duty looking game looked great. That was great. Yeah. Um, but you know the, the designer is going to have to make good use of the assets they have and make sure they hit that frame rate. And mm -hmm. it's all about gameplay. So the standing demo, uh, while we could walk around in about a three foot by three foot, it was grid, a little bit bigger than that, maybe. Um, yeah. The only demo that had a treadmill effect was that last demo. How did you feel about the treadmill effect? Do you mean where I was? When you say treadmill effect, you mean where I was standing still, but my camera was moving? Yeah. Um, it didn't bother me. I, I don't really get motion sick though, so it's difficult to say. I. I the thing that I noticed in that last demo more than anything else is that 
And the last oh. demo is the right. walking through a street. You're not actually moving. The camera's moving, kind of like a slow motion bullet time. You know, it's things are exploding around you. It's reminiscent of the Gears of War ad from the, with the Donnie Darko song for the first Gears of War, mm. um, where there's where you're basically going song, down a street. Right. Yeah, Mad World. And there's a lot of explosions happening around you and all that stuff, and it's slow motion, so you can take a look, good look at everything. The thing I noticed about that is that a lot of the cheats that that developers do when they can't when they know that you're not going to be able to look into things like explosions or smoke clouds, aren't going to work in VR. Because the first thing I did, I saw a trail of fire and smoke. I dipped my head down into the fire and smoke, and everything went away because it's not volumetric inside. Right. Um, so like, I think there's going to be there's changes that we haven't even considered that are going to have to happen as a result of VR. On the game design side. On the game design side. side. The, the other thing that I thought was, a, that they did a really good job highlighting here with the demos they showed was the sound cues. Mm. So the, the low poly farm that we talked about, uh, they used, there was a cardinal up in a tree, you heard it chirping. They have HRTFs in the headset now. And you literally, like I turned and looked, knew exactly where the, where the cardinal HRTFs, was. HRTFs, for people who don't know. Uh, head related transfer functions yeah. or something like that. Head, yeah. head relative. Anyway, it's positional, uh, it's positional audio. audio using uh, the uh, mathematically pr uh, mathematically describing how sound comes into your ears and the difference between when you the time difference between you hear a right ear left ear uh, that can place the sound in any place in a 3D space around you except for I think uh, below you it doesn't work. Um, so the cardinal you heard the cardinal chirp turned around fish splashed over here, you turn around and look right at the fish. And that's the kind of stuff that when you're in a 360 environment is super duper important because otherwise you're going to miss all the cool stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad to see that they're working on that. We knew that was going to end up being really important. So I definitely had a sense of presence a couple of times. The ledge that we talked about a minute ago, when you got your foot up on the edge of the pad, which g gave you an inch off the actual ground and kind of let your toes feel like they were dangling mm -hmm. over something, super creepy. Right. I don't get vertigo in the real world, so it was weird to get it in VR. Um, the dinosaur demo, you're standing in a big open hall. I think this is one of your favorites. Mm -hmm. um, and a huge Tyrannosaurus Rex comes down the hall, sniffs around, roars, walks over. You kind of, you, you just instinctively duck. Yeah, the, the demos were give you a sense of place, of environment, mm -hmm. where even though you don't have a physical body in that space, when you're looking around and the scale is right, that's, those are the demos I felt like gave the best sense of presence. And that, the one big takeaway, though, I think, and I'm not sure if this has been, I mean, they talk about input, is I think there's going to be a developer kit for input. They said no more DKs for HMDs. But, I mean, they have those USB ports on the front of the goggles, so. My bet is that before consumer version comes out, we'll see a developer kit and, for input. And in order to get the sense of presence that I want out of this, I need to be able to put my hands up in front of me and see them. On the Gear VR, you can do a pass-through camera where you see through the camera that's on the front of the, of the, of the phone, on the back of the phone, rather. I, I want that on, on this but just a representation of my hands. I don't want the, you know, I don't, I don't need all the other stuff. Yeah. So Crescent Bay, it's on display here for people, anyone people to check out at, uh, at CES. If you're in Vegas, hopefully, you know, try to get in and try it out. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll be at GDC. I'm sure they'll be at E3 and fingers Sundance. crossed. Yeah, Sundance, also South by places. Southwest. Cross fingers yeah. for CV1. I'm ready. Next year. I'm, I'm, my body is ready. See you guys later. See ya. Bye.